On the northeast coast of the Peloponnesian Peninsula, 100 kilometers across the Saronic Gulf from the Greek capital of Athens, stands one of the greatest wonders in the ancient world, the Theatre of Epidaurus. Nestled into the western slope of Mount Kynortion, this majestic 14,000-seat limestone amphitheater is the most well-preserved in the world and arguably the most beautiful. A UNESCO World Heritage Site, the site is one of modern Greece's most popular tourist attractions and continues to host performances of theater, poetry, and music nearly two and a half millennia after it was first built. But the wonder of Epidaurus goes beyond its age and beauty. For the venue is also renowned for its legendary acoustics, which are so good that even the faintest whisper can clearly be heard by every spectator, even those in the back rows. But how did the ancient Greeks accomplish this without modern electronic amplification technology or acoustic knowledge? Well, let's find out as we dive into the mystery of the ancient world's greatest feats of acoustic engineering. Built in the mid-4th century BCE, the theatre of Epidaurus was actually part of a much larger complex centered around a temple dedicated to Asclepius, the ancient Greek god of medicine. People from across the Greek world traveled to Epidaurus to worship Asclepius and to be treated for various afflictions by doctors and priests. Thanks to these pilgrims, the city or polis of Epidaurus grew prosperous and the temple complex soon expanded to include all manner of facilities including public baths, gymnasiums and a stadium for physical training and hosting ritual games, a hospital, dormitories, an Odeon or roofed theatre for musical performances and finally an amphitheatre for the staging of religious dramas and rhapsodies, the recital of epic poetry. Just who built the amphitheatre at Epidaurus and when is still a matter of some debate. In his travel guide, Description of Greece, 2nd century CE Greek traveler and geographer Pausanias attributed the structure to the sculptor Polycletos, writing, The Epidorians have a theatre within the sanctuary, in my opinion, very well worth seeing. For while the Roman theatres are far superior to those anywhere else in their splendour, the Arcadian theatre at Megalopolis is unequalled for size. What architect could seriously rival, for it was Polycletos who built both this theatre and the circular building. End quote. But while this claim has been widely accepted ever since, in reality the most well-known Polycletus lived in the late 5th century BCE, a hundred years before the theatre is generally thought to have been built. It is thus likely that Pausanias confused him with another, later Polycletus, possibly even the sculptor's own grandson. Whatever the case, architectural and other archaeological evidence suggests that the theatre was constructed sometime between 360 and 340 BCE. The structure itself largely adhered to the standard design scheme of ancient Greek and later Roman amphitheatres. At the centre, a circular orchestra of packed earth, 20 metres in diameter, which held the chorus, a group of 10 to 20 actors who provided commentary on the action on stage. Epidaurus was almost unique in having a circular orchestra, the only other known example being the amphitheatre at Argos. The orchestra was surrounded by a two-metre-wide circular drainage channel called the Europos to prevent it from becoming flooded with rainwater, while in the centre stood a limestone altar, or thymoli, used in ceremonies honouring Asclepius and later Dionysus, the god of wine, theatre fertility and religious ecstasy. To either side were pathways, or ramps known as paradoi, used by the players to access the orchestra and the stage behind it. Over time, the singular paradox was also applied to the first song sung by the chorus at the start of the play. The paradoi also served as entrances and exits for the spectators, and to aid this process, the first row of seats were set back slightly from the edge of the orchestra. Behind the orchestra stood the scheme. Originally a temporary enclosure built of wood and canvas, indeed in ancient Greek the word scheme means hut or tent, this gradually evolved into a permanent and often elaborately decorated stone structure, sometimes flanked by an additional pair of structures known as paraskenia, the plural being paraskenian. The scheme served a similar function as a modern theatre's green room, being used by actors to change their costumes and masks, as well as to store and hang painted backdrops called pinakes. There was also a convention in classical Greek dramas that characters never died on stage, instead retreating off stage into the scheme. Between the scheme and the orchestra stood a raised 20 by 6 metre platform known as the proskenion which oh, is the main stage upon which the main action would occur. And for all you theatre nerds out there, yes, this is the origin of the modern word scene, scenery, and proscenium, the archway in modern theatres that separates the stage from the audience. 
Finally, radiating outward from the orchestra was the cavea, or coilon, the seating area for the audience. Measuring 118 meters in diameter and composed of concentric limestone benches rising up the hillside at an angle of 26 degrees, the cavea at Epidaurus wrapped 198 degrees around the stage and was divided into two main sections, a lower section with 34 rows of benches and an upper section with 21. These two sections were in turn separated into multiple pie-shaped segments called kirkides by radial pathways called clemakes, and divided from each other by a radial pathway called a diazoma. In an impressive example of attention to detail, the front edges of these benches were hollowed out to allow audience members to sit more comfortably and tuck their feet in to let others walk by, while the first row of seats, known as the Proedria, was reserved for honored guests like priests and officials and was fitted with backrests for even greater comfort. A maximum capacity, the Carmia could seat nearly 14,000 people. Unlike at other sites, such as Athens, the builders at Epidaurus did not have to contend with buildings or other obstacles, allowing the amphitheater to be made perfectly symmetrical. Many experts, including theater architecture scholars Armin von Gerken and Wolfgang Müller-Wiener, now believe that the Epidaurus Amphitheater was actually constructed in two phases. The first phase, which produced the orchestra, skein, and the lower section of the cavea, was completed near the end of the 4th century BCE, while the second section of the cavea was added sometime in the 2nd century. However, as the actors' voices could no longer carry to the back of this new extended cavea, a raised proscenium was added, along with a second story on the proscenium to help with projection. At the same time, the proedria was moved to the upper section of seating to give honored guests a better view. The amphitheater remained in use under the Romans, who judged it so acoustically perfect that unlike many other Greek theaters, they did not modify its design in any significant way. Indeed, in the 1st century BCE, the great Roman architect Vitruvius wrote, Therefore, the ancient architects, following nature's footsteps, traced the voice as it rose and carried out the ascent of the theater seats. By the rules of mathematics and the method of music, they sought to make the voices from the stage rise more clearly and sweetly to the spectator's ears. For just as organs, which of bronze plates or horn-sounding boards, are brought to the clear sound of string instruments, so by the arrangement of theatres in accordance with the science of harmony, the ancients increased the power of the voice. However, the site eventually fell into disuse, and in 395 CE, the theatre was partially destroyed when the Goths invaded and sacked the Peloponnese. Later, in 426 CE, uh, the Christian Emperor Theodosius II closed Epidaurus as part of an empire-wide crackdown on pagan rituals. Finally, the theatre and the surrounding temple complex were rocked by a series of earthquakes, whereupon the site was completely abandoned and left to be covered up by centuries of silt and soil. For nearly a millennium and a half, the great theatre of Epidaurus lay buried and abandoned, until in 1881, Greek archaeologist Panagiotis Cavadius, working for the Archaeological Society of Greece, rediscovered the site and undertook the first formal excavations. To the archaeological community's delight, he found the cavea to be mostly intact, though the skein was in ruins. Over the next hundred years, three major renovation projects were undertaken to restore Epidaurus to its former glory. By Cavadius in 1907, fellow archaeologist Anastasius Orlandos between 1954 and 1963, and the Committee for the Conservation of the Monuments of Epidaurus from 1988 onwards. Following the first restoration, performances began being staged at Epidaurus for the first time in 1400 years, with the first being a production of Sophocles' tragedy Electra in 1938. And in 1955, Hellenic Tourism Organization and Minister of the Presidency Georgius Rallis launched an Athens Epidaurus Festival, which takes place every May to October and stages not only classical Greek plays by the likes of Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, but also contemporary theatrical productions and musical performances. Made a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1988, along with the neighboring temple of Asclepius, Epidaurus is among the best-preserved classical theaters in the world and allows modern audiences to experience performances much as their ancient Greek forebears did, crystal clear acoustics and all. But, well, back to our original question, just how does the Epidaurus Amphitheater achieve its legendary sound, and how did the ancient Greeks manage to achieve such advanced acoustic engineering? Over the years, 
Many theories have been put forward. Some have speculated that the theater's symmetric, concentric design allows sound waves to travel radially to every audience member without obstruction, or that its orientation helps funnel prevailing winds from the Saronic Gulf up over the audience, carrying the actors' voices with them. Others have posited that the bowl-shaped theater acts like a giant parabolic mirror, collecting and concentrating sound waves, or that the steep slope of the cavea minimizes the distance between the actors and the farthest audience members. And still others suggest that the masks worn by the actors in classical Greek plays acted like simple megaphones, allowing them to project their voices to the back rows. However, none of these theories have proven entirely satisfactory. For one thing, many ancient Greek theatres share similarities in design, geography, and orientation with Epidaurus, but do not exhibit the same acoustic properties. Secondly, if the theatre did function as a giant parabolic mirror, then it would concentrate sound in a spot far above the stage where nobody could hear it. And while masks may have played a role in amplifying ancient actors' voices, the fact that even unmasked modern actors can easily be heard from the rearmost seats suggests that this isn't the whole story. However, it was only very recently that researchers finally came up with a convincing and comprehensive theory to explain the amphitheater's unique acoustics. In 2007, engineers Nico de Klerk and Cindy de Kaiser of the Georgia Institute of Technology conducted a series of experiments to study the propagation of sound around Epidaurus. These involved generating various standardized sounds in the orchestra using electronic frequency generators or physical sources like popping balloons and firecrackers and placing microphones at various locations around the cavea. The data from these microphones was then fed into special software to analyze the frequency spectrum and speech intelligibility of the received sounds. As expected, the analysis revealed the intelligibility of the sound to be extremely high, between 85 and 95 percent, even at the rearmost benches. Less expectedly, de Klerk and de Kaiser discovered that throughout the theatre, nearly all frequencies below 500 hertz, like the murmur of a crowd or the sound of the wind, are eliminated, while higher frequencies, like those of a projected human voice, are preserved. This results from the specific size and spacing of the stone benches, causing them to act like an acoustic diffraction grating. Low frequency sounds are reflected into each other and cancel out, that is, interfere destructively, while high frequency sounds are unaffected. The entire theatre thus functions like a giant high pass acoustic filter, letting only the desired frequencies through. Similar structures are seen to this day in the form of corrugated or spiked acoustic tiles to, used to damp out echoes and ambient noise in concert halls, recording studios, and indeed this space right here. But the filter at Epidaurus is not perfect, cutting off some of the lower frequencies of the human voice. However, this makes little difference to audience members thanks to an effect known as virtual pitch, described by de Klerk as, quote, a neurological phenomenon that enables the human brain to reconstruct a sound source even in the absence of the lower tones. This effect causes small loudspeakers to produce apparently better sound quality than you'd expect, end quote. These findings are not entirely without precedent. Indeed, in 1998, American acoustic engineer David Lubman described a similar phenomenon at the 1,300-year-old Mayan pyramid of Kukul Khan at Chichen Itza in Mexico. Uh, when someone claps their hands at the base of the pyramid, the resulting echo returns with a much higher pitch, likened to the chirping of a bird. Just like de Klerk at Epidaurus, Lubman determined that the stepped sides of the pyramid act as a high-pass filter, scattering and filtering out all but the highest frequencies in each clap. He further argued that far from being a mere acoustic accident, this phenomenon was purposefully built into the pyramid's design in order to evoke the cry of the sacred Quetzal bird. Indeed, Kulka Khan was the Mayan name for the Quetzal. If this is indeed the case, it would make the Pyramid of Kulka Khan the oldest known example of physically recorded or encoded sound in the world. A similar effect can be observed today at Epidaurus. When one claps one's hands in the orchestra, a very high-pitched, almost metallic echo is returned, stripped of all its low-frequency components. Yet despite this, de Klerk was still surprised by the results at Epidaurus. Quote, when I first tackled this problem, I thought that the effect of the splendid acoustics was due to surface waves climbing the theatre with almost no dampening. While the voices of the performers were being carried, I didn't anticipate that the low frequencies of speech were also filtered out to some extent. Of course, these findings are based on experiments conducted in an empty theatre. As de Klerk admits, the acoustics would very likely be affected by the presence of 14,000 audience members, though exactly how is difficult to gauge, quoting again. For human beings, the calculations would be very difficult, because the human body is not homogenous and has a very complicated shape. 
The effect is also highly dependent on the use of limestone as a building material, which even in the ancient world was expensive and labor intensive to work with. Many later Greek and Roman theaters made extensive use of cheaper materials, like wood in their seating, which may explain why they failed to replicate the unique acoustics of Epidaurus. But how did the ancient Greeks figure out how to design such a sophisticated acoustic filter? Well, if the History Channel has taught us anything, the answer is clearly aliens. Trekking, you know, from Atlantis to the mainland via ice road truckers or some such. But as compelling as that explanation might be, the most likely explanation is unfortunately the simplest. The ancient Greeks didn't. And more on that in just a bit. But for now, though some systematic musical knowledge, like the so-called Pythagorean tuning scheme of perfect fifths, was known to the ancients, there is little evidence that they understood the propagation of sound waves in any theoretical sense. And in fact, there is little evidence that this particular theatre had any such perfect acoustics. What it did have was likely a lucky accident that was then replicated and perfected over many years through trial and error. But this fact should not in any way take away from the obser ingenuity of the ancients. Indeed, Vitruvius noted that both Hellenistic Greek and later Roman designers had enough practical knowledge of acoustics to strategically place hollow clay resonator jars or sound boxes around theatres in order to amplify and enhance the sound coming from the stage. However, despite these tantalizing discoveries, as alluded to, the most likely explanation for the amazing acoustics at Epidaurus may also be the most disappointing, that they don't actually exist at all. While tour guides at modern day Epidaurus will wax poetic about how even a pin dropping or a match being struck in the orchestra can be heard all the way in the back of the cavea, most recent research suggests that this may be a little bit more wishful thinking. In 2017, a team led by Constant Hack, assistant professor of building acoustics at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, conducted experiments similar to those of the Georgia Tech team, placing a pair of speakers in five different orientations in the orchestra and playing a signal that swept through all audible frequencies from low to high. They then recorded the resulting sounds using microphones placed at 12 locations throughout the cavea. This procedure was then repeated at two other ancient Greek theatres. The Odeon of Herodus Atticus in Athens and the Theatre of Argos, producing some 2,400 recordings for analysis. The team then made a number of laboratory recordings of various faint sounds, including coins being dropped, paper tearing, a match being struck, and a person whispering. These were played back, along with background noise, to a number of volunteers who were permitted to adjust the volume of the recordings until they could hear them clearly. Hack and his team then fed this data into their acoustic model of the Epidaurus Amphitheatre to determine how far each sound would carry through the theatre. The results were less than impressive. In stark contrast to Epidaurus's legendary reputation, Hack and his colleagues found the acoustics to be little better than any other regular theatre. While a coin being dropped or paper being torn would be noticeable throughout the theatre, they would only be recognised as such around halfway up the cavea. Worse still, the sound of a match being struck or a person whispering would only be discernible from the first few rows. In order to be heard and understood all the way in the back rows, ancient Greek actors would still have had to project their voices, as actors are still trained to do to this day. So, well, what's going on here? How, despite scientific evidence to the contrary, did Epidaurus gain its nearly 2,400-year reputation for uniquely perfect acoustics? Well, one possible explanation is given by Dr. Bruno Fazard of the Acoustics Research Center at the UK's University of Salford, who suggests that the legend of Epidaurus is deeply tied to the romantic idea of lost ancient knowledge. Quote, when we then come across these beautiful structures from the Greek and Roman eras, which were basically the very first clear acoustic design spaces, oh, we kind of revert back to that idea that they had this wonderful knowledge and they were somehow in touch with something magical that allowed them to do it in that way. End quote. By contrast, Armand Angor, associate professor of classics at Oxford University, believes that while acoustic research like that conducted by Nico de Klerk and Cindy de Kaiser certainly has value, it doesn't tell the whole story. Quoting him, The research is based on theatre that has changed over the centuries, so it looks terribly precise and mathematical, but in the end, we cannot be at all confident that the way it sounds today exactly replicates the way it would have sounded then. End quote. And according to Damien Murphy, professor of sound and music computing at the University of York, such detailed dissection of the theatre's acoustics may rather be missing the point. Quoting him, any performance arts venue is not just about what they sound like, it's about the experience of going there. 
In conclusion, while the ancient Greeks may well have developed surprisingly sophisticated methods for improving the sound quality in amphitheaters, the legendarily perfect acoustics of Epidaurus are likely as much of a myth as the epic stories that played out on its stage. <laughs>